Well, it is time for the Friday wrap, and boy, there is so much going on. It's not hard to find <laughs> topics to discuss, but uh, let's start with the fact that since Investor Day, there has been so much content created around what happened on Investor Day, so many breakthroughs in our understanding about Tesla, and most of it is stuff that should make you optimistic as you could possibly be if you weren't already over the, over the moon. Oh my goodness. Well, this is Randy Kirk, and uh, you know what to do. Uh, you've, you, you, you're supposed to like the video. You're supposed to uh, subscribe. I could use more subscribers. Uh, that, that helps the algorithm. If you haven't subscribed to this uh, channel yet, would you please subscribe? It would really help. And then Patreon, uh, obviously, I'm looking for folks that would help to support what I'm doing here with the uh, with additional income that I can get from Patreon because uh, basically I have expenses here. Some guys uh, complain about the fact they're doing it all on their own. I'm going to complain about the fact that I have a staff in the Philippines that helps me with the editing and with the thumbnails and with everything else, and I got to pay them. So, <laughs> so anyway, if you could help out with the Patreon, that'd be great. Okay. Let's talk about this investment flow, the flow of information that's been coming out since Investor Day uh, has been just absolute, like nothing I can remember, even from Battery Day, from IA Day, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, so it's, it's been crazy. Um, even just in the last 48 hours, there's been uh, two or three videos that you really probably want to go take a look at. Uh, Matthew Donegan Ryan, uh, that Donegan Ryan part is a hyphenated word, D-O-N-E-G-A-N dash Ryan, R-Y-A-N. Uh, he's done a series of videos about conversations that he had with the mucky mucks at Tesla when he was down there. He was one of the 50 retail investors who was invited, and he got to talk to folks that had a lot of information and they were willing to share with him, which is the incredible part. So he, his videos have just been uh, absolutely eye-opening. Uh, he did one today on Cybertruck. Uh, in, uh, most of them, in fact, have been on Cybertruck, but the one today was had the dimensions of the current version, which is probably pretty darn close to what's going to be. And it's shorter. It's short enough to fit in my garage. So, hey, maybe it'll fit in your garage too. Anyway, um, let's. Uh, but that's one of the videos that's out there right now. Uh, Farzad. Uh, he did a video today that in his regular Friday afternoon video where he brings on a number of guests. Well, today he wisely brought on one of the authors uh, that was involved in the Elon Musk mission. He brought on uh, Brian Wong and Brian uh, was able to really fill in some blanks with regard to Cybertruck. I'll be having Brian on on Monday. Uh, maybe it won't be published till Tuesday, but really talking about the capacity and capabilities of Cybertruck in a way that I don't think anybody else has talked about yet, because what? Because Brian's so smart. That's why I had him in the book. That's why you need to read the book if you haven't read it yet. Um, and uh, But Brian will bring us some more information uh, that ties into what he was saying all along about Semi, which we put in the book and which he has talked about since the book, um, the capabilities of Semi and the capabilities of Cyber are going to make it untouchable for many, many years into the future. They will sell everyone they can make. And Brian and I, as you may know, both believe uh, Tesla will make at least a million semis before the end of the decade per year. I believe, uh, and I think Brian does also, that they'll be making multiple millions of Cybertrucks because the TAM will be massive. Now, does it? Do, could they possibly need another version of it? Uh, one that's more like a van or one that's a little smaller. I don't know. But the concept is so completely out ahead of anything else in the pickup truck world that they're going to need to, they're, they're going to need to sell a bunch of them. Okay. The third um, video that was out there today was one with Joe Justice. I forget the program that he's on. Just look up Joe Justice and, and put a a date stamp of you know the last 24 hours or whatever. Joe Justice is talking a ton about the about the ma manufacturing facility in Mexico. You want to watch this this uh, uh, video. I am going to see if I can get Joe Justice on the program next week, uh, uh, and and you know and to talk about it in more of my understanding rather than the way that the interview went. But that's that's a long one. It's like a three hour interview. 
Um, I highly recommend it. It's, see if you can find it. I'll try to remember to put a, a link below so that you can find it. All right. And then uh, tomorrow, um, I am going to have, I just uh, finished an, uh, a, uh, uh, a, an interview with uh, Joe Munarato, Munarato. <laughs> having so much trouble with his name, Joe Munarato. And Joe is uh, uh, a guy who's been very active on Twitter recently. And we're going to do a couple of videos together there where we talk about what's happening with inflation. And of course, Kathy Wood will be doing her report in a couple of, uh, couple of hours, and I'll be doing my report on her report. Um, so this inflation thing looks like it might be under control. We'll see what Kathy has to say. But I think the Fed needs to cool it. And in particular, I think they need to cool it because as you probably well know, we had a bank problem today um, with uh, trying to remember the name of the bank again here. I thought I put it in my in my information here, um, but, oh, the SVB bank. Um, yeah, the so the SVB bank, um, I don't know if you could say it failed yet. Let's say that they stopped trading in the stock. The stock was down billions and billions of dollars in terms of uh, uh, investor value. Um, and then a couple of other banks were uh, also seemingly in trouble. So with these bank problems that are taking place, uh, a couple of people, a couple of people that I trust have said, hey, you know, it may be that the Fed will slow down or stop, not do the increase uh, uh, next week uh, or the following, I forget exactly the day. Uh, maybe they won't do the 25 basis points and certainly not the 50 basis points just because of what's happened with these banks, because you don't want to exacerbate and make that even a bigger problem. You know my position on it. I think the Fed needs to stop now. They need to pause they need to let this thing play out. They need uh, some months, uh, maybe three, four, five months. I think the risk is greater of the economy being harmed irreparably by continuing to increase the rates than there is a risk of the inflation going out of control if they pause for a few months. I think that's the balancing act they should be taking. And I hope they're listening to me. <laughs> what do you think? Put that in the comments below. You know I love your comments and, and try to respond to all of them. Okay, so um, what is what was in the news that we need to know about? Well, the one thing in the news was that women are coming back into the workforce. So the even though there was a very substantial number of uh, new jobs created last week and another substantial number this week, 300 and something thousand, which was uh, in line roughly with what people were expecting, but still a lot. Um, but the uh, in, the unemployment rate went up two percentage from 3.4 to 3.6. And that was because there were people coming off the sidelines back into the workforce. So that's an interesting trend to watch. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. Having said that, there's still 1.9 jobs available for every one person looking. So I don't see how the Fed is going to affect that in even the long term. I think we could be looking at a year. The, the, I think the Fed would have to screw down the economy for a year before we could get that back to where it's even in balance, much less uh, the other way. So one other factor that you know I always talk about on my Friday night uh, results and sometimes on my Monday night uh, on my Monday night version where I talk about what's coming in the future week is the 10-year bond. Now, over the years of my investing history, I didn't pay much attention to the 10-year bond, except when inflation has been an issue. Because why? Because the 10-year bond is kind of the what you would call the crowd version, the crowd understanding of where inflation is. So if you're sitting right now with the 10-year bond still at 3.8, 3.77, uh, at the end of the day, and it came down again today, even in this with this good jobs report, that's saying that these people are willing to buy long-term bonds at 3.77 for, you know, and hold them for, I mean, theoretically, technically, you know, hold them for 10 years. But what that, what that usually says is that that is predicting that inflation is two points lower than that, because typically the investing class wants to make 2% over inflation. So that would mean that the bond market thinks inflation is at 1.77, 1.7, 1.8, 1.85. So that continues to be the case. And I'm not, this is not just Randy, you know, saying this stuff. This is also Kathy Wood. She's been saying it for months. And I agree with her. That's a number that I think really the Fed should be looking at 
the bond market does not agree with the Fed in terms of what inflation, what's happening with inflation. Um, so useful information. Take a look. Uh, again, I'll have two programs, probably both tomorrow. One will be Kathy and one will be, will be Joe. Um, and Joe talking again about inflation in a completely different way, a very unique way of looking at some curving, looking at signals, looking at noise, because that's what he does for a living. He's always, he's, he's in the business of figuring out what the signal uh, signals are from data and then figuring out what the noise is and what is relevant and what's useful and what you can use for prediction. So that both of those will be tomorrow. You need to see both of those. So if you haven't subscribed yet and hit the notify button, then you should do both of those. Okay. So what about crypto? So I've been using crypto as my gauge of whether it's risk on or risk off. Well, if you watch my video on Wednesday, you know, I think risk is completely off the table now. I think nobody's risking them. Cash, 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 cash. Everybody's in cash. Um, a couple of people on Twitter today who are heavy investors. No, nope, I'm out. Uh, they're going to, they're in cash. They want to see what happens over the next couple of weeks, because it's just the, the option in terms of ups and downs and who knows where the market's going to go. So lots and lots and lots of people are in treasuries, are there in bonds, um, are there in cash? Um, and, and again, we'll, I'm waiting for Kathy tonight to give the report, but I believe we'll find out that this is a historic high, total historic high for people being in cash, investors being in cash. So there's this massive amount of cash on the sideline. And if you follow me, you know that I think it gets itchy fingers after a while. I don't think people like to make 2% over inflation. I don't think that's where most investors want to be. Uh, the investor class tends to want to make more than that. And so I think there's itchy fingers looking for something to jump into. So that brings me up to the last subject of the, of the, of the day. And that is why did Tesla today beat the market? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if some people are starting to look at Tesla as more of a value stock as a can't go bad stock, as a it's going to do fine stock. And maybe it's not overvalued. In fact, maybe it's undervalued. Maybe they've been watching my videos and they know that I, I, can't, I can't begin to understand why there's no value on energy storage, why there's no value on the, uh, 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 the uh, what do you call it, the Optimus robot. There's no value on the superchargers. There's no value on Dojo as a service. There's no value on the insurance. I mean, basically, no, no value on semi trucks. No value even on on cyber trucks, uh, which are coming shortly. So there's six different six there six different parts of Tesla, which are basically give it, given zero value. The entire value, the entire six hundred billion or less than that now five hundred and fifty whatever billion dollar valuation of Tesla is on the sexy cars. That's it. And that just is crazy. And the $600 billion or less valuation for the sexy vehicles might be fair. It's probably not. It probably should be higher, especially if you have any belief that FSD might happen or robo-taxis. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a nutty valuation. As far as I'm concerned, it's just nuts, which is why I put my last three nickels in on my, but uh, yesterday, I think I, 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 I last, I, my last three nickels that I could invest, I invested. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, the Tesla might, it might be the time when the story on Tesla is shifting. You look at all the other opportunities out there and you go, well, Tesla looks like they have a growth story no matter what, with all these divisions, with all of this expansion. So maybe that's a good place to put my money that would be absolutely secure and yet have a massive upside potential. Anyway, that's my theory. I'm sticking with it. I hope you've uh, enjoyed today's video. Um, look forward to those ones tomorrow. I think you're going to be a little mind blown by what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. And uh, hey, for today, it's been great talking to you.